Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning to all of you and welcome to this book review. We'll be talking about Mary Roach's Gulp. Now, Mary Roach has written other books like uh, Bunk, The Curious Coupling of Science and Sex, Spook, The Science Tackles the Afterlife, Stiff, The Curious Lives of Human Cadavers, Grunt, the latest, her latest book, The Curious Science of Humans at War, and she also wrote Packing for Mars, Voyage into the Science of Life in Space and Space on Earth. Uh, but today we're going to talk about Gulp. Now this is a wild ride down the elementary canal. It is scientifically correct, like most of her books, in fact all of her books. It is full of interesting details. At places uh, it can be disgusting, revolting, gross. I try to avoid some of those, but it's always funny. At times, in juvenile life, medical student humor. So let's start at the top, the mouth. Her first chapter, no job. Tasting has little to do with, with taste. She starts by reminding us that taste is mostly odor, mostly smell, 80, 90% smell, some visual, and the rest is tasting buds, and it is very personal. Uh, you must have heard, of course, the old saying, the gustibus non es disputandum, which means you can't argue about taste. Um, and so <clears throat> you must, you might remember this guy, the nose knows. He is the proof. He is the proof that smell or the, the taste is in smell. Now, if the taste is so personal, how we talk about it? Well, we got some help. Uh, there are some professionals who taste different foods and things, the tasters of beer and wine, olive oil, cheese, apples, you name it, everything, including pet food. Yes, there are people who taste pet food. Anyways, um, they, uh, they, they, they are good for helping us uh, talk about these things. For example, uh, Wine Spectator has this uh, uh, review of how the, they classified wines. Uh, the higher the number of the classification, the better the wine, of course. Uh, so these tasters are good for, for marketing, for, for obviously, but also because they, they create a lexicon and a protocol that help us talk about it and compare products. Um, for example, with respect to wine, we talk about body and fruitiness and balance, complexity. And there is a protocol with wine you know, that we have learned from these people. Uh, you have to open it way before serving it. You have to let it breathe. Uh, you look at its color. You smell its aroma. You swirl it and then see how the wine adheres to the size of the glass. And you, you taste it by first aspiring. <laughs> of the wine. So, so these are things that we learn from these tasters. And by the way, expectedly, uh, she says that price is not a good indicator of good taste. Visual perception influences the assessment of taste. Um, you may be fooled by the color of, of, of the food or the drink that you're consuming. Uh, you must have gone to a some place in, in the St. Patrick's Day and you're served green beer. Uh, you don't expect it to taste like beer, but it does. So it sort of fools you. Sound also may influence the perception of taste. The sound of crispiness and crunch in, in, in potato chips, for example, is very appealing. 
Uh, they, they signal the freshness, signal health. In fact, there is a patent, which is a system whereby snack foods or snack food bags have a downloadable code on the back with which you can play music. Uh, there are different musical pieces for the different products. Here's the patent. You see, you uplink the website, you, you put it against the, uh, the website and you uplink the website, you scan the code, you download the music clip, and then you play the music while you're consuming that product. There's an association of each product with each piece of music. And here it is. Flavor and music. This is an abridged version. Uh, so, for <clears throat> the association that they want you to make with their product is the following: with the electric lime and sea salt, uh, they say. Energetic and upbeat like the melodies and lyrics of pop music. With their product, Flaming Hot and Dill Pickle, they say, if hip-hop was a flavor, it would be Flaming Hot. And for the Kettle Cooked Classic Beer Cheese, they say, a bold, exciting flavor that matches the incredible feeling you get when you listen to rock music. So, so there you are. Chapter two is dedicated to pet food. <clears throat> pet food is nutritional, but it is tasteless. It's probably more nutritional than the stuff that we eat. Um, uh, but in order to make it palatable to, uh, to the animals, well, they, they put these palatins on the dog food, the flavor coatings. Uh, for the dog uh, food particularly, the, the main ingredient of the palatin is liver, which is the most nutritive organ. And this has been, by the way, selected by dog tasters. And I don't mean human tasters, I mean real dog tasters, uh, like, like this one. Now, he's really uh, enthusiastic about the pate. Uh, actually, I think I would be too. It looks very good. Uh, so, the, the, the development of taste appears to be evolutionary. In other words, the body has learned to desire things that are scarce. Wild carnivores eat the viscera first because it is the most nutritive. And so they develop this taste for important uh, uh, scarce nutrients, and so do humans. Humans develop the taste for salt, uh, for high energy fats and sugars, which were scarce in the African savanna. And this may be the reason for the popularity of junk food. And also fatty foods, we love bacon, and uh, my steak better have a piece of uh, fat on it, otherwise it's just not not that good. <laughs> Chapter three, liver and an opinions. She talks about organ foods. Inuit, for example, uh, not having vegetables uh, in their menu, they eat organs uh, for their vitamins and minerals. And uh, this fits in with what I said before. Um, uh, the body sort of makes them desire to eat the organs first because that's where the nutrition is. It tells us about an experiment that was done with babies. They were presented with different types of foods, minced or mashed. They were presented with fresh fruits, vegetables, eggs, chicken, beef, liver, kidneys, brains, sweetbread, bone marrow. So guess which two were the most popular with these children? 
sweet bread and bone marrow. That's what they love most. Well, sweet bread is an organ and bone marrow is fat. And I, by the way, I love bone marrow. It's, it's just a great tasting snack. But you know, children really uh, change their, their, their likes, change their taste uh, as time goes by. Parents really drive uh, what kids eat. And so once they have gotten used to the parents' uh, food, uh, that's, that is what they like. And so that is ingrained later on in, in their person. Uh, in, in World War II, meat was rationed and the government tried to offer organ, organs to, uh, to the troops. <laughs> they wouldn't go along with that. Well, maybe because of the ingrained habits that they have, of, uh, of not eating organs at all, or very little. So the government tried it in a different way. They tried to convince the, the population to eat organs so that they can send more meat to the troops. And so one, one such attempt with fixed testicles was introduced uh, by the hospitality food program at uh, where, you guessed it, Ball State University, indeed. <laughs> um, strangely enough, this uh, habit, uh, it remained. And, and even today, people consume this festival. There are these Rocky Mountain oyster festivals, uh, many pl uh, places of the country. Uh, but I suspect that they don't really go there and eat them because they like them. I think that it goes there because, well, it's a festival and because it's, it's funny. Americans really don't, don't eat organs, uh, although the rest of the world does. Now look at this, this uh, uh, person, uh, how she reacts uh, with a perfectly fascinating chilled monkey brains. I don't understand. Anyway, this comes from the Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom movie. So Americans really have a limited repertoire of foods. Um, the average American eats 14 different foods. That's it. Um, they're it's just set prejudices. No organs and no strange food. Nothing like that. People really like what they eat rather than eat what they like. It's difficult to change these habits. In chapter six, Spitz gets the polish. She talks about saliva. You know, there are two types, the stimulated and the unstimulated. Uh, the stimulated saliva, stimulated by food, of course, has two main functions. One is to digest food already. So digestion really starts in the mouth because this saliva contains enzymes that break down different foods. There's the amylase that breaks down carbohydrates. There's the protease that breaks down the proteins and lipase or fats. Um, the other function of the stimulated um, saliva is the adjustment of the pH. You must know that when you ingest, you put something in your mouth that is acidic, like, uh, I don't know, orange juice or, or lemon juice, there's a surge of saliva. And that is to, to adjust the, the pH uh, of your mouth. The other saliva, which is the unstimulated saliva, that flows constantly. And uh, it has other functions, different functions. One is to remineralize your teeth. I didn't know that teeth can be, could be remineralized, but you know, it seems that like it is constantly remineralized and it is because of this, uh, the, the uh, unstimulated saliva. It turns out that uh, the people who suffer from Sjorgen's disease, which is dry mouth disease, or people who is, um, uh, whose salivary glands don't work, perhaps because of uh, uh, radiation therapy, um, they, their teeth soften and they have to, to do other protocols 
uh, to remineralize their teeth. The other function of the unstimulated uh, saliva is to trap bacteria. Uh, this saliva contains anti-clumping proteins, which prevent the bacteria from forming large colonies. Uh, they don't kill the bacteria, uh, but they don't allow it to proliferate uh, too much. And so <clears throat> this is why the wounds inside your mouth disappear relatively quickly in about a week. And they almost never get infected. Um, the same wound, if it were outside on your skin, it takes, it takes longer uh, to, to heal. And from here comes the old saying of lick your wounds. Now I'm taking a, a parenthesis here on something that is not in the book because I thought it, would, it was interesting. Uh, a newspaper article in October 19, 2020, um, just a short time ago, informed us that they discovered a new anatomical feature in the head. And that is two new uh, saliv salivary glands. We knew of the six, the two parotid glands, the two maxillar, maxillar salivary glands, and the two sublingual salivary glands. So they'd seen, they, they discovered these two. So instead of six salivary glands, it seems that we have eight. To me, it's amazing that at this day of age, uh, we're still discovering anatomical features in the human body, but there it is. Next, Mary Rose discusses what goes on in the stomach. Um, a couple of centuries ago, a famous study on how the stomach works was done with by Dr. William Beaumont, military surgeon in, in Michigan, with his subject, Alexis St. Martin. Uh, he was a Canadian, uh, French Canadian, so it's Alexis St. Martin, if you want to be correct about it. Um, so poor Alexis St. Martin, or St. Martin, was accidentally shot in the abdomen. Uh, Dr. Beaumont saved him. Uh, uh, but uh, the way that he, his wound healed was very strange. It healed in an open fistulated passage, something like this. Uh, so so the, 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 everything is healed, but you could see into the stomach. And you could not only do that, you could take things out or put things in the stomach. And uh, Dr. Beaumont was very interested in learning uh, how the stomach works, and he convinced um, Saint Martin uh, to help him with this, and he did it for 10 years. So he did a lot of uh, experiments with uh, Mr. Saint Martin. Uh, here is a famous uh, painting by Dean Cornwell, 1938 which shows that in this particular case, he's taking material out of the stomach. Anyway, he determined a lot of, the, lot of things, interesting new things, such as the vegetables were digested more slowly than meat, such as the milk coagulated early in the digestive process, and so on and so forth. The 57 new conclusions, some of them really revolutionary. And today, uh, fistulated cows are, are, are being used as standard tools uh, for research in agriculture and veterinary. This one, look at this girl, young woman. He is reaching inside the, the cow's stomach. And here is the cap. This is how you fix it in on here. This is how you close the hole. And you can see through it because that has a window, it's a plexiglass window. And so you can see what's going on in there. And of course you can do all sorts of experiments. <clears throat> in chapter eight, Big Gulp, Mary Roach discusses pig appetites. 
Could Jonah have been swallowed by a whale? Well, by a sperm whale, perhaps, uh, because they, they, one one case they have found a 405 pound giant squid intact in the stomach of a sperm whale. The other whales, they don't have uh, that big digestive tract and they would not be able to swallow anything big or as big in one piece. Uh, here is the, the possible case of the, uh, the sperm whale swallowing the, this enormous animal. Anyway, if, uh, if uh, the sperm whale did uh, swallow Jonah, he would not have survived. Um, first of all, the, the, uh, the whale has teeth. <laughs> and, but more importantly, it's got gastric juices. And so the gastric juices would have done him in. Uh, no question about it. The life tissue is digested. Some live, some animals uh, consume live animals themselves. Uh, when I was a child in the, in the jungles, uh, I was attracted by a crying chirp. And I went and, and finally found that it was a frog that was uh, emitting this chirp that was being swallowed live, of course, by a snake. We ourselves eat uh, uh, living things like oysters, for example, and they're consumed. They're digested. So if light food tissue is digested, the question is, how come the stomach does not digest itself? Well, it does and it regenerates every three days. Now, the digestion is a constant, con continu continuous process. But in, in some animals, it is just not convenient uh, to, to digest the food. Uh, for, for example, with penguins, <clears throat> when penguins have their chicks, they have to feed their chicks. And sometimes they are far away from the open ocean where they can feed themselves. So what these penguins do is that they walk maybe for days and enter the sea and feed themselves and then walk back uh, to their chicks. Um, and and then, then they feed their chicks. Now how do they, what do they do to not digest the food themselves? Well, they do it by lowering the temperature of their stomachs whereby the, the, the gastric juices um, are no longer active. And so it's, it's, a, it's an interesting way of, of altering uh, the digestive process. So how much food does an average person consume in one sitting? Well, the answer is about a pound. And what is the record of ingestion in one sitting? Now hold on to your horses now. Answer 22 and a half pounds. It's, it's almost impossible to believe. Can you believe that? 22 and a half pounds. Well, it's true. There she is, Molly Schoiler. She downed 22 and a half pounds in less than an hour. In June 28, 2017. Can you believe that? Can you visualize this thinner woman? It's not even, she's not a big woman. Can you visualize her with that piece of meat in her stomach? And it's, 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 it's incredible. It's enormous. Um, kind of difficult to believe, but it's true. There are people who are competitive eaters. And uh, there is even a com an international federation of competitive eating. Look at them. These are the champions. Look at those belts. <laughs> Just like the wrestling champions or the boxing champions. And look at the people themselves. I mean, they're not fat. They're not even big. So how do they do it? Well, it turns out that you have to have a predisposition to be able to expand your stomach. And most people don't have that. Um, and so those people who do have the predisposition, 
they train and so they train by ingesting water. Uh, so <clears throat> the normal stomach holds about a gallon. A predisposed and trained stomach will may hold about two gallons. So I was curious about this. I was curious about this one. And and the record breaking 20, 20 and a half pounds of meat. How big was her stomach when she consumed that piece of meat? So I calculated it. Here it is. 2.7 gallons. That's an incredible number, but it's true. 22 and a half pounds of meat divided by the density of the meat, 8.3 pounds per gallon. Her extended stomach after finishing the piece of meat was 2.7 gallons. That's incredible. Upstairs, the alimentary canal as a criminal accomplice is chapter 11. And uh, she talks about transportation. Uh, specifically, she talks about prisoners who commute uh, to work. And there, there are a number of prisoners who are allowed to go out of the prison to work and they have to come back and spend the night in prison. Well, uh, those, uh, they smuggle stuff inside the prison in their rectums. There was one case, um, in a prisoner in one go smuggle the following things. Oops. Smuggle in one go two boxes of staples, one pencil sharpener, three <laughs> sharpener blades, wow, ouch, <laughs> three jumble binder rings. Well, uh, he became known as OD or Office Depot. But uh, prisoners smuggle all sorts of things, tobacco, drugs, cell phones, medicine, money. Uh, I remember in the, the, the book Papillon, they made a movie of Papillon with Steve McQueen and Dustin Hoffman. Uh, Papillon uh, was uh, a person, he was a prisoner um, sent to Devil Island in, in South America uh, for presumably for killing somebody. And uh, although the movie doesn't show this, but the book certainly does, that he smuggled money into the prison that way. It was a necessary thing to do for them. Um, Mary Roach then writes three whole chapters on flatus. In chapter 12, Inflammable You, she informs us that the, the gases produced by the body are mainly hydrogen, 80% hydrogen and some methane. Um, and well, this is the, the, the reason why you have to be so thorough in cleansing before a colonoscopy. Um, unfortunately, in 1977, there was a fatal accident in France. When the doctor started the polypectomy, which is burning off Pilot, uh, polyps. Um, <laughs> there was an explosion whereby the colonoscope was ejected like a torpedo. Um, uh, don't worry because they have changed their protocols ever since then and they do things quite differently to avoid that. Um, in the early days of the space program, NASA fretted about the flammable flatus built in, building inside the small space capsule. And uh, partly for that reason, they circulated 100% oxygen in the training capsules. And that was the cause of the fierce uh, fire that killed three astronauts when a spark went up. You see, the 100% oxygen makes things burn a lot faster than uh, atmospheric oxygen. And so that, that was the reason uh, for, for these people's... Uh, demise. In chapter 13, The Dead Man's Load, she tells us of her visit to AK Pharma uh, for an interview uh, for this book. They make a product called Bino, a gas preventer. Now this is Bino. 
It's an enzyme uh, supplement, dietary supplement, uh, to, you know, to, to improve digestion and reduce comfort. But the interesting thing is that um, she, she tells us that after the interview, she was given a souvenir. And the souvenir she was given was a Beano windbreaker. Yes, indeed, a windbreaker. Um, and here it is. It's true. It's a wind. This is what they gave her. But not only that, she also found out that AK Pharma sponsored a team of hot air balloonists. True. <laughs> she then explains uh, that once we go beyond the suckling age, the baby age, we no longer need lactics. In fact, 75% uh, of Asians, Blacks, and Native Americans are lactose intolerant. Also, 25% of the West. I personally am not. I like milk. I enjoy milk. Um, but those who, who are lactase intolerant, they stop producing lactase in early ages, even four or five years old. And uh, because they don't uh, produce lactose in their small intestine, the digestion of their uh, of di dairy products is done in the large intestine and they're done by bacteria. And that produces gas. And that is what produces the discomfort. So she has recommendations uh, what to do. Uh, recommendations for sufferers of chronic lattice, avoid milk products or buy a dog. So you can blame it. Chapter 15, Eating Backwards, deals with enemas. Now, enemas, you know, as, as a way of feeding is, is, uh, has been accepted uh, by the medical community a long, long time ago. President Garfield was kept alive this way. Um, <clears throat> and even today, is, it is being uh, used in some cases. Uh, I remember I was an inventions manager, and I remember I had an invention um, that was the needleless infusion system. This was mainly for uh, neonatals, uh, very small babies, uh, you, you know, very small babies who need infusion. Uh, it's very difficult to find a vein to do that, uh, and so this needleless infusion system. Uh, would have taken uh, its stead, into the, the, its place, and it was uh, through the anus. Uh, it was to the rectum. Um, you inserted the, the, the pad that would diffuse uh, the um, whatever you needed to be infused into the baby, and it worked. And then the feeding also works. In the Middle Ages, in Lent, the growling, <laughs> growling stomachs steered some of the faithful to have feeding enemas. In fact, it was so prevalent, it was almost a fad. So much so that the Catholic Church was confronted with a serious theological dilemma. Does rectal feeding break fast? What should we do about it? Well, the Church eventually relented. Another theological problem arose in the 1600s when a mother superior's rectum was possessed by Satan. Don't ask me. But the exorcism was successful uh, when a rectal enema was administered, with holy water was administered. So that was, uh, that was solved. In the last chapter, the ick factor. Uh, Mary Roach Roach's fecal transplantation. Well, as, as you know, <clears throat> humans have more than a thousand species of bacteria in their gut flora. And most of them are anaerobic. That is, they don't use oxygen. They don't need oxygen. They die in the presence of oxygen. The composition of this flora is very personal and is stable throughout uh, one's life. Uh, there are some good uh, bacterial flora, like the Cerecia coli, Lactobacilli. That is the bacterium that uh, 
digest uh, dairy products, and bifidobacteria, and there are some bad ones, uh, Clostridium difficile, Enterococcus fecalis, and Lampylobacter. Now, all of these are present in the gut, uh, but they're present at different uh, amounts, or, or different ratios, and the bad bacteria are most probably very small amounts are present in, in the gut. Uh, but sometimes this balance may be upset by some circumstance. For example, the use of antibiotics. The antibiotics kill all of the bacteria, and then they 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 grow back. But if they grow back <clears throat> in a in a different ratio, bad bacteria may prevail. For example, Clostridium difficile may prevail, and uh, that that. That is a real problem because that causes um, serious diarrhea and it, it can actually kill people. 16,000 deaths per year uh, due to bacteria difficile infections. And uh, so, so what do you do in, the, in that case? Well, the solution is a fecal matter transplant to reinstate the proper balance. So how does that work? Well. A healthy person makes a donation. That material is taken to the laboratory. It is homogenized in a blender. It is filtered. And then it is given to a patient uh, by colonoscopy. And, uh, and that works. That patient's uh, health is restored. And eventually, his own flora is restored. In other words, the proper balance, the, the personal balance of the flora is restored. So it works. And perhaps because of that, there are some products on the market called probiotics. Now, probiotics are live, live organisms, um, which are going to claim to, to provide health benefits when consumed uh, by improving or restoring gut flora. Now, here's an example. Probiotic, acidophilus, 100 million organisms. That's true. However, probiotics are considered generally safe to consume, but not very useful. Why? Because they're aerobic bacteria. And your gut bacteria is mostly anaerobic. So, you know, you may buy these products, but don't expect too much from them. And so, um, we reached an end, and I think I'll stop now. And so, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.